I just want to hand over to today's speaker who will be very well known to, to many of you. We'll have seen lots of his high profile work, uh, Professor Ben Goldacre. Ben is a doctor, academic, writer and broadcaster, trained in medicine at Oxford and UCL um, and has done a lot of work, for example, in you know publishing trial results as one notable example, but he's, he's, his career brought, is, is goes across many areas. And today he's kindly agreed to come and join us to talk around the Open Safely platform and its use in COVID-19 time. So Ben, we appreciate your time and we look forward to hearing from you. Hey, thanks for having me. And um, look, in these troubled times, I can't see the faces of anxious people when I talk for too long. So I've got a timer which I'm going to make myself adhere to. Um, so look, thanks for inviting me. I'd like to talk about um, a rather unusual project that we've built called OpenSafely.org. Um, this is something we constructed during the COVID-19 pandemic, starting in mid-March of 2020. And working on behalf of NHS England, we've now built a full open source, highly secure analytics platform running across the full pseudonymized primary care records of 55 million patients. This is a huge collaboration across uh, my group, the Data Lab at the University of Oxford, the Electronic Health Records Research Group at London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, led by Liam Smith, Electronic Health Record Vendors, TPP and EMIS, giving pro bono collaboration, and also working in very close collaboration with NHS X and with NHS England, acting as the data controller to enable access to the data under the COPE regulations. And we're running across an unprecedented scale of data. It's every individual patient's full primary care GP records. So that's all diagnoses, tests, referrals, prescriptions, and so on. That's all linked onto their data from SUS. So that's hospital admissions, outpatients, visits, and so on. ECDS, coded A&E attendances. CPNS, which is death in hospital from COVID, but flows faster than ONS. We have ONS with cause of death. We have SGSS COVID test results. We have a household indicator, which allows us to identify the other pseudonymized occupants of any household, which is how we've been able to do work on household transmission. We've got ICNARC ITU data, ISERIC detailed hospital records of hospitalized COVID patients and much more. And despite this unprecedented scale of data, privacy advocates like MedConfidential have actively praised our privacy model. Now, I'll talk a little bit more about how we do that in detail later on, but it's an unusual approach. First of all, to preserve patients' privacy, we don't let users download data onto their own machine to work on it there with R and Stata. We don't even give them naked access to that data in a remote desktop. Instead, we've built the analytics platform inside the electronic health record system vendors data centers where the data already resides. Now that's important for reasons that we'll discuss in more detail, but it's only the simplest of our data architecture choices. We also have written bespoke software for the whole data management pipeline. And by imposing light touch standards on that, three important things follow. Firstly, it means our variables are readily reusable and understandable to everybody else. Secondly, it means that we can share readable and intelligible logs about everything that's happened on the data. And lastly, and most importantly, it means that we can generate dummy data, synthetic data that reflects the real data well enough for code development to be done in the open, but we don't use that dummy data to execute the code. Instead, you develop code in the open against the synthetic data, and then that code is sent through to execute against the real data in the closed environment. Now, because we work inside the EHR vendor data center, data flows with unprecedented speed. GP data flows with a one day delay, vaccination data with a three day delay, and we choose to rebuild the open safely mirror about once a week. So for our vaccine research, the data is four to 11 days behind clinical event, but it could be four days if there's a strong operational requirement. All code and all code lists are shared by default and indeed must be shared openly under open licenses for reuse. That's the only way that you can execute code on open safely. And that's to address some of the shortcomings that we've seen in the health data research landscape where code and code lists are not shared and indeed sometimes are actively withheld. With this, we're developing work on COVID risk factors um, disease, drugs, ethnicity, follow up of COVID, um, and let me show you just very, very briefly a couple of examples. Hang on a mo. There's a button here. Um, how's that? Yeah, got it. Uh, yep. Yeah, okay. So um, 
more interested in methods than results, but here you go. And um, here's our nature paper. All right, so look, here's our um, paper from last year. Um, looking at factors associated with death from COVID-19 in a subset of the data, TPP practices only, um, looking at 17.4 million adults. Um, here are a couple of other examples. The paper on the left, I think, has just been accepted in the Lancet. That's um, ethnic differences in COVID-19 infection, hospitalisation and mortality in 17 million patients. On the right is an example of some of our pharmacoepi, looking at um, pre-exposure, so primary care use of hydroxychloroquine and whether that changes your um, risk of death from COVID. Um, this here is an example of some of our service restoration work. So we can monitor in great detail the kind of activity that's happening in primary care and we can do trends and variation in that work. Um, and actually the headline finding from this, and again, I, I'm talking really about the platform today rather than individual studies, but I think this is an interesting piece. Um, you can see here the top right uh, cholesterol testing at the peak of, the of wave one of the pandemic. You can see that across the whole country, people stopped doing cholesterol tests, as you'd have hoped. In fact, you might argue anybody doing cholesterol tests during the peak of the first COVID pandemic um, needs to have a bit of a think about their priorities. I'm sure they were mostly just added on to another bucket of tests. Um, but below that, you can see that uh, INR tests, clotting tests for people on warfarin, remained unchanged. And that's actually a tremendously reassuring picture, I think. That's uh, a, a health system that shows itself to be um, fully adaptive to the challenges that it's facing. It defers non-urgent activity, but it persists with urgent activity. And then lastly, we've got some vaccine safety work coming. We've got some vaccine effectiveness work that we're sharing um, with the PHE vaccine effectiveness group at the moment. And we also have some vaccine coverage work and the advantage that we have with Open Safety is because we have the full primary care record of every patient in the country, that means that we can see exactly who is and isn't getting the COVID vaccine down to very fine clinical and demographic subgroups. So for example, top right, you can see the very substantial um, differences between ethnic groups in their odds in um, whether or not they've got the vaccine. And that's looking just at the over 80 population. And below is one of many examples of uh, the reporting that we've done broken down by final clinical subgroup. So reassuringly, overall, we found that people with um, previous history of chronic obstructive airways disease, cardiovascular problems, cancer and so on uh, have uh, are as likely to get the vaccine as anybody else. But we gave very early warning of the fact that there was substantially lower vaccine coverage among people with learning disabilities, with severe mental illness. Um, and with dementia. Um, and you can see that those are shifting over time. And we can give actually quite narrow uh, um, population breakdowns as well. We can go to um, lower tier local authority if we wish. I mean, we can actually go down to individual practice level if we wish. And um, if there's time, I might talk a little bit about our privacy model and how it relates to what we can do in terms of protecting um, uh, clinicians preferences around privacy as well as uh, individual patients. So that's the kind of output that we've produced but as I said more interesting to me is the platform and how we built it because this really is unprecedented data and what I want to talk about is first of all some of the problems that we wanted to solve and then secondly um, our design architecture choices and how we address them. So number one um, Pandemics call for bigger, faster data. A global health emergency requires that you have access to an enormous volume of data and in near real time. If we think about the way that research is typically done on, for example, factors associated with death from COVID-19, it would normally be done through a service like CPRD, a GP Research Database, previously known as, and you would have some intermittently extracted records. You might have hairs a year after it was coded or a few months after it was coded. And you'd have these records for only a few million patients from a conventional research data service and you'd, you'd download them onto your local machine uh, to work on them there. 
Now, the problem with that is during COVID-19, new cause of death not seen before arrived suddenly, risen in prevalence very rapidly. The first wave of COVID-19 would have come, peaked and gone away entirely before any cases appeared in most conventional health research data sets. In addition to timely data, you also need huge numbers of patients in a research data set. And that's especially true if you want to understand different risks from COVID-19 in smaller subgroups of the population. So, for example, if you want to understand different risks in people with haematological and non-haematological cancers, then very tragically, you need enough deaths or enough predicted deaths in each group to be able to assess the differences. And it's the same for understanding the change in risk among people in a given on a given drug. Let's say there are 100,000 people taking a drug and one in 2,000 people in the country have died from COVID-19. If your research uh, sample only contains 10% of the population, then you'd only have an expected five deaths in, uh, in the 10,000 people taking the drug for your statistical models. And that's obviously going to compromise the precision of your estimates and also your ability to do fully adjusted models. So you need very large data and you need fast flowing data. But the challenge then becomes privacy, and it's important to understand the privacy problems we're able to or aiming to overcome, principally the challenge of re-identification. So the common means for ensuring that people cannot be identified when their health records are shared is called pseudonymization. Specific and very disclosive pieces of information like your name, the calendar date of your birth, the last digits of your postcode are removed from the record. Now, superficially, that's appealing, but the challenge is that, unfortunately, records that have been pseudonymized in that way are still very vulnerable to re-identification. Now, to be clear, researchers are trustworthy and they're carefully evaluated to be trustworthy. But to understand privacy and security risks, researchers talk about threat modeling and work through worst case scenarios because you want to make sure that your security systems are as resilient as possible within reason. So with that in mind, here's an example of how you might think through the vulnerabilities of pseudonymization. If you know that somebody had twins in 2013, another baby in 2014, and then moved from the London region to the Oxford region in 2015, that would probably be enough to uniquely identify them in a carefully pseudonymized GP data set. There's probably only one person with those characteristics in the country, and that's my wife. And having identified my wife, you could then see all other aspects of their medical history that are recorded in the same data set, including things that you didn't already know about them. You could also probably identify me using the pseudonymized household identifier. Now, that's not just true for me, of course. It would be very straightforward to identify Tony Blair, knowing probably only the year of his birth and the weeks in which, as a matter of public record, he had his um, uh, abnormal heart rhythm treated at a hospital in London. Now, importantly, the risk of re-identification from this approach increases as your data set grows to cover a larger proportion of the total population. So let's say you've got a 10% sample of the population and with three characteristics you know about somebody you're trying to re-identify them, trying to re-identify, you do find one unique person who matches those three characteristics. Well, assuming no additional knowledge, all other things being equal, you can only be 10% certain that you've identified your target because there might be another nine matches in the remaining 90% of the population. But if you have data on 100% of the population and you find one unique match for the characteristics you know, then you can be certain you've found the target of interest. Now, sometimes people are quite dismissive about this as a problem, and I think that's risky for a number of different reasons. First of all, um, in order to justify access to data, we need to make uh, a clear demonstration that we are taking all reasonable, practical, currently available steps to um, manage the privacy risks. And if we can manage privacy, which Open Safety demonstrates that we can, then in my view, we certainly should. Secondly, this is not a theoretical risk. So you'll often find in local newspapers examples of individuals who perhaps working on the front desk of a GP surgery have um, stalked their ex-girlfriends or girls they went to school with or their ex-partner to find out where she's now living with their children using the medical records. So we know that it happens with medical records. Secondly, we know that people um, use uh, large data sets to extract data inappropriately. For example, lots of media stories about celebrities come about because of leaks from uh, police records. I think there's been one recently of National Pupil Database and tax records. So we know that this happens and so it makes sense to manage it. So we wanted to have access to huge data sets. We wanted to do it in a really private way. 
third bit of background before we get to our design choices. We wanted to make sure that all code was being openly shared for all analyses. Now that's really important and it's been a bugbear of um, my groups for a long time, but I think it, um, it bears repeating. Um, you want all code and code lists for all analyses shared for a number of reasons. Number one, reproducibility. So narrative descriptions of the methods used to manage and analyse data are generally ambiguous and insufficient to help others understand or replicate the work. That's particularly important at the moment when you're trying to understand and resolve discrepancies in the results of different analyses. So, for example, Public Health England, Open Safely and ONS have all produced slightly different results from adjusted models exploring the putative additional risks of COVID death associated with ethnicity. And it's unclear whether those discrepancies are, are, are partially or wholly attributable to different source data, different data management pipeline, such as variable categorisation, um, different models or who knows what else. Where you can see the code that people are running, then you can see uh, what the reasons are for divergence. And again, this is not a theoretical issue. Um, there are examples, for example, from CPRD, where you will find two different papers published in the same year addressing the same clinical question that get opposite results. And there is no way from reading the paper that you can understand why because you can't see the data management pipeline, you can't see how the raw event level data was converted into a regression ready one row per patient data set. You also can't see the model. And it's very interesting to me how you often find a, you know, a long wordy verbose description saying we did a mixed effects logistic regression, blah, blah, blah. And you think no matter how many times I read this, I cannot actually tell what you typed. XTME log it, then what? And you actually find yourself often thinking it would be fewer characters if you just gave me the command. So reproducibility. Second, um, you improve quality through review. All research will have shortcomings. Reciprocal review can improve quality, identify errors. Problems might arise in data analysis code or data management code. For example, it's not unheard of to find ocular hypertension codes appearing in a list of diagnostic codes used to identify patients with high blood pressure. And these problems are best caught early. Coding errors have led to high profile retractions and outside in academia to incorrect implementation of clinical algorithms and patient safety concerns. So a culture of caring, sharing code uh, helps to address those problems and to drive up the quality of, of the work in the whole community. Thirdly, efficient reuse. So it takes a huge amount of work to generate data management and analysis code. And when that work's been done once, it's useful if that work is available for review and then considered reuse by others running an identical or similar task. That's the norm throughout the open source software community and in many other areas of scientific research, physics, genomics and so on. It facilitates efficient innovation rather than repetition of low value tasks. And it happens much more readily if the original code is um, at least annotated or somewhat standardized, as we'll come to in a moment with Open Safely. Uh, then smaller print, but nonetheless important capacity building. When new analysts uh, and new researchers and developers come into my team, they benefit from libraries of code which show the tasks that they're learning being practically implemented by others before them and in a reasonably readable and well documented format, for example, in a Jupyter notebook. Lastly, trust and accountability. So different stakeholders, it is fair to say, have varying levels of trust in the ability of government and, in the, and the NHS to make best use of their data and to protect their privacy. And sharing code openly provides an additional oversight mechanism. It encourages analysts to write higher quality code, discourages inappropriate use of data. And obviously the public mostly will not review code, knowing that it's in public and can be audited and provides some reassurance. So those in headline form were the issues that we were aiming to address. Lastly, before we get to the meat of what we did and how it all works, um, we wanted people to share code, but not in a messy way. Now, typically when people process one row per clinical event data into a nice one row per patient data set, they do it in a kind of jumble of a bit of SQL, a bit of R, a bit of Python, a bit of Stata. The story typically goes, oh, well, Barbara's really good at SQL. Get Barbara to do a, an, an extract from SQL and then she'll put it in the shared drive. 
And then Tom had a PhD student who's written a Python script and that'll stitch together the nine different data sets. And then you import that into Stata and then you can reformat the dates and then you can make some of the derived variables and then you can go. And the problem with that is none of it is shared in any kind of um, reusable or reproducible way. It's all very, very um, operator specific and project specific. So we wanted to create a kind of generalizable framework. So oh, it's really hot in here. Imagine that feeling hot last week was not something I thought would happen. So here were our objectives overall. Number one, massive open source um, data analysis platform. More data than ever before so that we could address COVID needs. Higher security than current offers in order to justify that higher volume of data. No huge data downloads like CPRD and others offer. No needless access to view the raw data as in many off the shelf trusted research environments, but researchers still able to run the analyses conveniently across the most um, disclosive raw data. We wanted all code for data management analysis to be shared to support open science, critical review and reuse so we can get more and better use of health data. But we also wanted it to be shared in a way that facilitates reuse. We wanted that data curation and data management, therefore, to be done in a pragmatically standardised framework that we were going to have to create. And over, more than anything else, we needed to do all this in a way that was completely transparent to the public and others about all actions on the data. Last up, we needed to reflect the low startup cost because you can get money to do single studies of your own, but you can't get money to create infrastructure in health data research or to help other people. We needed it to be completely modular and we needed it to be portable to other settings because we wanted to be able to move open safely as a software layer to other environments where the GP data and other data sets were made available in the future, for example, NHS Digital or NHS England. So, 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 let me tell you what we built. Number one, as I said, we built the analytics platform inside the existing data set, inside the data centers of the electronic health record software providers where the data already resides. Now that brings a number of key advantages. It means that trusted analysts can run analyses across data in near real time instead of waiting for intermittent data extracts. And for context, the full records of the entire population of England amount to about 100 billion rows of data. That's information on a scale where it would take a long time to send it over the largest secure internet connection. It would be faster to cycle to the data centre with a hard drive in your backpack than to download it over any um, internet pipe. It also means that you get, uh, you're already operating in a highly secure environment, compliant with standards like ISO 27001 um, from the moment you start. It means you can keep logs of every action on the data, but it also brings other less expected advantages. So Open Safely is a huge collaboration across a wide range of skills, including electronic health records researchers from London School, including software developers and developer researchers in my group, um, all working on behalf of NHS England, but the EHR software companies themselves, Enus and TPP, are also a key part of the team. And they bring a huge amount of experience and expertise in working with the electronic health records data because they built the software platforms that generate and manage it in the first place. Now, that's not to say we're wedded to building it there. It's portable code, but it is a really important issue. Number two, going beyond a trusted research environment. So I mentioned in brief that we've built a bespoke data management pipeline which is um, somewhat standardized. Now to explain what I mean by that let me see if I can give you some examples of what the underlying data looks like. I must say this is either a really fun talk or a really boring talk depending on your world view and it's quite difficult doing it alone in your spare bedroom when you can't see anyone's face. I have no idea if you've all gone off to finish your emails or not but anyway there you go all right so are you even still there anyway here we go we're here we're here oh good all right that's all the reassurance i need if there's just one person listening i'll carry on um okay so uh, this is what uh, raw electronic health records data looks like people who work in research often imagine that you will have um a, a variable like has diabetes um, or has had a hip operation. Of course, that's not true. These are practical working documents. They are aid memoir for clinicians to help them manage their patients. And so they're built to reflect that and they have all of the benefits and shortcomings of a data set that's built for that narrow purpose. 
So typically you have one road per clinical event and you'll have NHS number, you'll have the patient's name, you'll have some kind of event code. It might be a CTV3 ID like this one, which is emergency asthma admission since your last appointment. It might be an AMP code for a particular prescription and then it'll have a date and a time and it'll have a location. Now, what you get in something like CPRD is the name and address is replaced with a pseudonym and the location is, a, is replaced with a pseudo location and then you still have one row per clinical event. What you want to produce <coughs> is something much more like this. One row per patient and then a binary variable. You want to know have they got a history of asthma and you'll create that with rules. You'll look for either asthma diagnosis codes or asthma treatment codes or investigations that mean that somebody's got a condition and you will turn all of those into a binary variable. You might have a treatment code where you say, I wanna know if they've had this particular drug in the last X months. You might want um, a numeric variable like BMI and you want an outcome like, have they died from COVID? Now you wanna produce all of these from the underlying records. And to do that, you're going to get uh, some code lists and you wanna match those code lists against the underlying record here. So you'll say, OK, find me everyone who's got any code suggestive that they've got, let's say, chronic obstructive airways disease. Now, these code lists are typically withheld from view, either passively or, as I said, in some cases, actively, where people seek uh, optimistically, in my view, to um, commercialise them. So I'll open safely. Anybody can use this. You can use this, by the way, to build ICD code lists. If you're interested, you can go along to codelist.opensafely.org and sign up. So you can see here every single code or code list that's ever been created. And if you click on the COPD one here, you can see some summary information about it at the beginning. And then underneath, you can see the full list of individual codes that you would look for in a given date range. And then underneath that, if you're really interested, you can see the tree in the complex poly hierarchy of uh, whatever data dictionary you've built your code list in. Now, you will take that code list and you will apply it using a blob of code. Now, this is an example of <coughs> how you build variables in OpenSafely. This is for the cohort extractor. Let me show you very briefly. This is if you're making a binary variable called COPD and you say, I'm looking for patients with these clinical events, COPD codes, which is the list I showed you here. So you're looking for any of these event codes you're going to return a binary flag. You want to find the first match in the period. You tell it the date range that you're interested in. And then this bit at the bottom is really crucial. You say return expectations and you say that you're expecting the incidence of a code in this time period to be 5%. Now that's really, really important. That is used for two different purposes. Number one, it's used to create a dummy data set. Now that dummy data set is yours to keep. You can download it. It does not in any way reflect the true underlying, um, you know, the co-segregation of um, explanatory variables in your data set or anything like that. You can build it in a very complicated way if you wish. You can even use a directed acyclic graph if you're really in the mood and produce something really, really fiddly. You use that data, that synthetic data for one purpose only, which is to generate your statistical analysis code. You do that in the open on GitHub where all the code is version controlled. We have code review, you can have unit testing and all the rest. Then only when that code is capable of running to completion. When you know that you haven't put a comma in the wrong place, you haven't called a variable, forgetting to put a capital letter in the right place and so on. When that data analysis code is capable of running to completion, and we know that your data management code to create your research ready data set, your one row per patient data set from the one row per event data set. When you know that your data management code and your data analysis code is capable of running to completion, it gets parceled up using uh, a container, using something called Docker. It gets parceled up and push through into the live environment, which you never have access to. You are never in, a, in an environment where you can tinker and play around with the raw underlying data. So your data management code goes into the live environment, produces your data set. Your data analysis code goes into the live environment, 
It produces your results tables, your graphs or your logs if your model has failed to converge infuriatingly, and then it dumps them in an outputs folder and you go along and you look at your outputs folder. And when you are confident that it contains nothing disclosive, then you press a button and the results of your study get pushed back out to GitHub to the repo from which it came. And that in outline is how Open Safely works. Now, I'll stop in a moment for questions, but let me just show you a couple more tiny things which I think are quite important. Um, a number of really interesting things follow from the fact that we assert control over the data management pipeline. Number one is it means that we can build things like open safely code lists and also our variable library. It means that every variable that anybody ever creates can be shared and reused very straightforwardly, very rapidly. It means that we can produce really informative and stereotyped GitHub repos. Um, now, to be clear, all of our code for absolutely everything that I've shown you is live online here. If you go to github.com slash open safely, you'll see that because I'm logged in, there are a few private repos um, and the private repos go public the moment that any results are shared and many of them are developed in the open as you go. Here's an interesting example. So this is our COVID vaccine research template. So we didn't build this for us. Um, there's a real strategic challenge and I'm doing the, uh, the Goldacre review, which needs a better name. I've been asked by Secretary of State Matt Hancock to do a review into how we can get better, broader and safer use of health data in the UK. Um, and um, we're really interested in um, creating reusable code, reusable knowledge objects, and we want to try and drive the creation of a, of a, 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 a modern, open, collaborative computational data science ecosystem, a community of people routinely sharing code. And we think, and this isn't the core of the review, but this is how we've implemented those principles in Open Safely, that one of the best things you can do is create tools and services which make it easy for people to do the right thing. And this is a really good example of that. So we have other people coming in and doing vaccine effectiveness research in Open Safely. And when they do, we can give people a nice standard template. So our vaccine effectiveness template has all of the explanatory variables that are in common to all different models, whether you're doing screening method, no matter what you're doing to try and take account of time varying confounders um, or any other um, approach that you're taking to um, analysing vaccine effectiveness. We give you a standard research environment where you have all of the variables there and ready to go. If you want to add any, then we can see what you're doing and we can add them back into the standard COVID vaccine research template so that everybody else can see them. Now, this is really important because it means that you can understand the reasons behind discrepancies between different study designs. You can exclude the question of whether they are giving different results because they're based on different source data, because all of the analyses are based on the same source data. It's the full raw electronic health records of the population of England, with a few exceptions. Um, you can also exclude um, that it's data management variable creation, or at least if one group does choose to create a variable in a radically different way to another, you can run sensitivity analysis. You can say, well, what if we replace your variables with that group's variables? And so it means that you can really zoom zone in on exactly what it is that's driving the discrepancies. And I think that's really um, important and really interesting. Another aspect of um, What's important about taking control of the pipeline and creating reusable variables and reusable knowledge ob objects is that it's worth making an investment in kicking the tires. So, for example, ethnicity. Um, every now and then people say things like, oh, why don't you use the NHS digital ethnicity table? Um, as if such a thing existed. In reality, there is no ethnicity variable for the nation. There is um, there is only the individual ethnicity codes that have been entered into people's records over time um, and ethnicity is considered to be a clinical event rather than an enduring property of a of an individual. So um, 
every patient in the country has between naught and dozens of ethnicity codes in their record. Now, um, about 70, 75% of the population have got an ethnicity code in their primary care data. You can bump coverage up to about 95% if you um, allow yourself to add in ethnicity codes from HES, from hospital data. Superficially, that sounds good, but it can also create problems because it means you've got less missing ethnicity data in the subset of your patients who are sicker and are in contact with hospital services. Now that might not matter in some analyses, but it might really matter in other analyses. Now we see this time and again, we see different approaches to creating a variable to identify the same underlying um, clinical or demographic concept. And what you wanna do is do the most robust internal and external validation that you can. Now it's really worth doing that if you're creating variables that are going to be used and reused many times in the future. And that's what we're doing in Open Safely. So we are producing um, short data reports, variable reports on things like what is the best way to do ethnicity using British uh, English electronic health records data, what are the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches, internal and external validation, and then you share all of that alongside the code block and the commands necessary to to, um, to implement that variable in open safely. We can do the same for things like uh, care home status. So again, it's extraordinary, but nobody really knows how to identify for each NHS number in the country, whether that person is or is not currently resident in a care home. There are lots of different ways of doing it. You can do it by address and postcode matching of the patient's address against the CQC's list of care homes. And there are lots of different ways of doing that address matching and some of them are good and some of them are bad and some of them are discrepant in ways where you can't be sure which is good and which is bad. But in any case, they all rely on the fact that the GP address is accurate. And in many cases, somebody goes into hospital, gets discharged, goes to a nursing home, but it's not anybody's first priority to go and update the GP record and bring up the front desk and change their records. There are other sources of information about the same concept, care home status though. For example, under, and this is so boring, but this is life, right? Uh, the NHS primary care networks DES specification since October incentivizes GPs to do some things to people who are in care homes and so there is a SNOMED CT code which is likely to be present for many people in care homes. So then you've got a binary variable that says are they in a care home yes or no and you can internally validate that against your address matching variables of which there will be many and see which is where the overlaps are and where the overlaps aren't and so on. So it facilitates good um, good hygiene around variable management and you're creating these enduring assets that are worth putting time into. Um, but the last thing I'll show you just very briefly is that um, it means, oh look, so here's all our documentation. If you want to learn how to drive open safely, go to docs.opensafely.org and you can see um, full documentation, everything that you want to do. So you can um, you can download all the code, you can generate your own dummy data, you can execute analysis code against it, you can check that it's passing all tests, you can basically do absolutely everything that I can do, except for one final step, you cannot execute it against the live data and view the outputs, but everything short of that you can do. Um, if you're interested, please get in touch. Um, we have got, uh, we've just appointed a whole bunch of developers and a whole bunch of researchers but we have a couple more posts about to go up online so send me an email if you are a great electronic health records researcher and um, come and work with us i don't know if it's crass to try and recruit people at um a lecture in a neighboring department um but you more importantly if you want to use open safely um we're happy to talk to people about implementing open safely against their own underlying data sets um, particularly useful if you're working with matched in electronic health records data, although the GPES data, which most people have at the moment, is not as detailed as the raw GP data that we um, work against. Um, if you want to see a nice run through of all of the code, you'll find it online. Here you go. It looks a bit like this. And here you can see a full run through of what it's like to execute code. And you can follow all of these steps yourself um, from the comfort of your own lockdown spare bedroom, if you are lucky enough to have such a thing. And then very lastly, this um, I think is a really interesting note to end on. If you go to jobs.opensafely.org, and we haven't launched this formally publicly yet, but it's reasonably performant, you can see 
absolutely every action that is currently executing against English patients data through open safely. And this is unprecedented and I think it's really important. So here you can see there's a couple of study, a couple of analyses that have been requested by JCVI looking at risks among people with learning disabilities. You can see uh, COVID vaccine effectiveness research. Bang on time. COVID vaccine effectiveness research looking at um, uh, two doses versus one. I think that one is um, post vaccination outcomes uh, notebook and SRO measures the system service restoration observatory stuff. And if you click on any of these, you can see the GitHub repo and the commit ID that shows exactly the state that that GitHub repo was in at the time that that code executed. Now that is a phenomenal degree of transparency, I think, and it's only made possible by the fact that we take control of the pipeline. Otherwise, all you'd be able to see is a bunch of arbitrary SQL and Python and R scripts. So I'll stop there. Thank you for having me. I hope you've got interesting questions. Thank you very much, uh, Ben, and I can reassure you that I'm sure we have a number of people in the department that would love the gory detail of the coding and how you've put it together. So I think you should be comfortable in that point. So we've got some questions in from the audience and I'm going to run through some of them um, in the next few minutes. So yeah. first question, some of them are a little bit technical about the background maybe and some are more general. Um, first question is uh, that you mentioned that analysis code must be open, but clearly yeah. some of our staff have been looking online, checking out the, the web page, looking at the jobs web yeah. page and, and said clicking, some of them you can open, some of them you can't. Yep. Um, is that a matter of just timing that these are projects underway that you have to wait for the project, you know, the team running that to be to finish their work before it becomes openly available? Or yeah, exactly. so so like I said earlier, um, typically GitHub repos are closed until the results are shared and the moment that the, that the results are shared, then the code is made open. Now, I'm personally much more happy with sharing code in development as we go. Um, there's a lot of variation in in the extent to which researchers are happy with that. I think sometimes people are worried about other people coming along and um, eating their lunch to, to use a phrase from open source software development community. Um, I think it is reasonable to allow people to develop code, bearing in mind that what you see on GitHub is literally version control code. And it's literally, you know, things as they're being typed almost. Um, and so I think that's um, I think that's a uh, it's it's an accord that I'm happy with to say that code is is shared openly at the point of um, the results being released, uh, and that includes preprint as well as publication. Um, the one thing I would add is in terms of presenting p hacking, this is all quite important as well because by looking at jobs.opensafely.org, you can see the code that has been executed against the underlying data and exactly the shape that it was in. So you can be absolutely certain that people, um, well, you can't be sure that people haven't engaged in taking multiple different analytic strategies until they get the p-value they're looking for, um, but you can at least see everything that they've done and because it's a broadly standardised uh, data management and analysis pipeline, um, it's much more readable than if people shared just their, a, a jumbled mix of um, SQL scripts and, and Python files and so on. Okay, great, thank you very much. So another question, was uh, one of our cancer researchers, Sarah Darby, she asks, do you have plans to link the data set up with can cancer registry data? Um, and if so, how might this happen? So um, there are there are easy and complicated ways of doing linkage. Um, I mean, the, first up, if anybody's interested in any kind of um, uh, specific uh, linkage or specific analysis in Open Safely, drop me an email. We're very happy to talk. Um, there are two ways of doing linkage to very detailed external resources. So to date, what we've brought into Open Safely are um, mostly either very sparse, like ONS death, you know, the date on which you died is not really a very disclosive piece of information, and it's the sort of thing that your GP could and would reasonably know about you anyway. Same goes for HES and SAS. Um, for ICNARC, it's more detailed hospital data, but I think nonetheless it's reasonable and proportionate. Um, as you get into more and more detailed external resources like um, uh, National Cancer Registry Service data, um, there are two ways of doing it. One is move the data into the data center where the EHR data already resides and then build an open safety backend against it there. A much more interesting prospect, I think, is minimally disclosive linkage across a number of different data centers. 
So, um, for example, with the ICNARC data, which is a few hundred rows of detailed hospital um, trajectory data for patients admitted with COVID, as it happens, we're moving the data over to um, uh, the TPP and EMIS data centres. What we could have done and what we will do in the future when we've got more people and resource is build the open safety back end in the data centre in Edinburgh where the ICNARC data, where the ISERIC data, sorry, already resides. And then that will boil it down. So let's say you only want an ordinal categorical variable about each patient's hospital trajectory. You want to know, was it a fairly trivial admission with a bit of oxygen? Was it uh, was it um, uh, really serious and long and protracted and horrible? Did they go to ITU and did, and did they die? If you want an ordinal categorical variable and you don't need all the detail, then you could write the code to generate that summary data set at the other end and only transport that. And I think that's um, uh, the the exciting future prospect for the for the UK in terms of sort of health data strategy is to have um, where appropriate. And I've got views on the right design architecture for um, TREs, but where appropriate, you might have a hub and spokes model where you have some uh, national EHR data assets in one um, set of TREs and you might have smaller bespoke data sets in others and you call only the minimally disclosive amount of information from one to the other. The key thing about all of that is that it has to be done using open source software, open source code. Otherwise, you just don't have innovation. You don't, uh, you know, I will not tolerate black boxes in particular for data management. Um, and that, by the way, is um, another interesting thing that comes up a lot with open safety and other stuff. Um, we have heard people from, I wouldn't say competing, but other uh, EHR um, analysis approaches. Um, people say, oh, well, you know, your data, our data is cleaned and therefore it's mm. better. Um, whenever anybody tells me they've cleaned the data, but they can't tell me how, that really gives me the, the heebie-jeebies. Um, I don't want anything done to source data that I cannot see. If there are event codes in 1790, don't correct them to 1990. I want to see them and I want to write the rules on how that's done. Um, so I think uh, with all of these things, it's all about making an open data management pipeline from the earliest source up to um, the final analysis. OK. Um... Rory Collins, head of the department, he's asking, he, he noted that you mentioned the example of INR and how tracking INR kind of continued as appropriate. But colleagues in our department have looked at uh, hospitalization for acute coronary syndrome and how that dropped significantly. And I think Rory's question is asking, do you know if there's any uh, evidence from primary care, GP practice, that actually they were aware of these events, but they weren't kind of filtering through to hospitalization? Any idea about that? Yeah, so two things on that. Firstly, um, there is a huge drop in the presentation of of, of not just acute coronary um, symptoms, but, but everything across the board in primary care. Um, that's a real challenge in and of itself. It's also a real challenge for understanding the consequences of COVID infection and hospitalisation with COVID-19. So um, we've published a paper, it's available as a preprint, looking at, for example, um, uh, rate of things like strokes, DVTs, um, MIs, diabetes after discharge from COVID-19 hospital admission. And it's a really interesting puzzle. So um, number one, you have a spectacularly increased risk of all of those things after you've been admitted with COVID. Number two, you see almost the same increase in risk of all that stuff after admission with pneumonia in 2019. So it's not particularly unique to COVID. However, you may say, well, look, there's a lot more COVID um, around than there is pneumonia in any given year and many more COVID-19 admissions than there are pneumonia admissions. So is there nonetheless going to be a huge health service impact from all of these extra strokes and heart attacks? But the problem is you're seeing fewer strokes and heart attacks for all of the reasons that we can all rehearse. So. Um, we see exactly the same pattern of things disappearing off in primary care and it's a real epidemiological head scratcher and we would welcome many many um many many eyes on it um one of the interesting opportunities i think is um first of all we can follow patients through the full um trajectory and look at drop off so odds of presenting to primary care with services and then odds of moving on to secondary care with 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 um a given problem um 
so there might be some windows into where the blockages are in the system, whether it's self-censorship, clinician uh, admission threshold and so on by looking at that. Um, other options include looking perhaps at whether there are regional differences or even clinician specific differences in presentation behaviour. Um, but look, all round, these mm. extraordinary changes are a, a, a real head scratcher. And the biggest head scratcher of all is the you know a, apparent suspension of presentation with things that really don't feel discretionary, like ACS. It, it's yeah. really, really difficult to understand. OK, we do have far too many questions to get through in the remaining time, but we'll keep going for a couple of minutes if that's all right for you, Ben. Um, yeah. One is a kind of, you know, stand back question. It says, in what sense are results emerging from a unique and massive data resource scientifically replicable? Or can you replicate or validate? Well, so normally you can't see the source data either. Um, I mean, with us, you can see the code, both for data management and for each individual analysis. Um, in principle, Everybody could, I mean, you know, legitimate researchers to my mind should have the opportunity to um, execute code against the underlying raw primary care and secondary care data that we run across. And we would very much welcome people coming to us saying we want to reproduce some of your analyses and we want to do um, different versions of the same. And that's exactly what we're seeing with the vaccine effectiveness work, for example. Um, so look, I mean, I, it's less of a problem than elsewhere because at least you can mm. see the code and the, and the code lists. And, and we, we have, as far as our resource will permit, um, an open an open door um, to helping others come in and, and execute code against the data. And I suspect one way or another, um, access to the data, I certainly hope, will become more straightforward, not just necessarily through Open Safely, but also through mm -hmm. other do you want me to read, through and read out the questions very quickly? That might be quick, or is that the wrong thing? If you, if you can see them, up to you. Whatever. Uh, well, you may, you're not going to get through all of them because I think we're probably down to our last couple of minutes. So okay. maybe I'll spare you because I've had a look at all of you know, I've looked through them. We won't get through all of them. There's a bunch of questions about data cleaning, but you have covered that in some detail. So another uh, question, why do you think medical and public health journals are still reluctant to ask for the code used for analyses of papers to be published? And the, the questioner says this has changed in other areas. Other yeah, it's, or, or it's really interesting. I mean, we published um, a, a, an editorial on this in the BMJ. They're still happy to publish. I mean, you know, QCOVID is a good example. Um, you can't see the code lists for data management um, very much as with QRISC. Um, you know, it's a commercial project and I understand that there are reasons for that. Um, some aspects are available, some aspects are not. Um, BMJ published our editorial, but are also happy with things being published without um, code and code lists being fully available under open licenses. I think it's a problem. I think uh, the problem is compounded by the fact that to even discuss it is somehow considered um, to be impolite or transgressive. And I think that's partly because sharing code and being transparent with your code, people have confused transparency as a kind of um, a public good being accountable with transparency and openness just as a practical move and, and I actually think the biggest benefits of openness are the practical benefits it's not about trying to catch people out it's about trying to help and it's about trying to create um, a modern open collaborative modular ecosystem where there are blobs of code that can be reused for different projects that are to the benefit of everyone um, but I think I think there are some people who are maybe um, have active reasons for not being up for that and that perhaps polices some of the public discussions and makes it feel like it's unfair to ask. It reminds me a bit of where we were um, on clinical trial results reporting 10 years ago um, and you know as many of you will know we've seen a spectacular turnaround on that um, if you go to eu.trialstracker.net and um, one of the resources produced by my group um, you can see that Compliance with EU trial reporting um, rules is about 100% for most drug companies, extremely high for now for most major research universities in the UK. Other countries are catching up. Um, when we first started talking about it, people thought that it was transgressive uh, to even raise it, and now it's just become the kind of default norm. I think this is, it's culture shift, um, and it's all compounded, of course, by the fact that we're going through a transition. So in the past, it was quite natural 
because data management and data collection was such a laborious and uncommon business, it was natural for people to assert monopolies over task. It was normal that you, the person who collected the data and managed the data would be the only person who would analyze it. Um, it's only since um, computational tools have become more widely accessible that it's become more common for lots of people to expect to do things and lots of people to expect to be able to reproduce things and examine the methods that were used. Um, and so I think it's natural that culture will shift. And for the most part, I think most of the people who choose not to share code today um, are certainly, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, the, the one thing that I have that, that I wouldn't say makes me cross, but the one thing that I think is actively problematic is, is sort of false flag, um, uh, discussion around um, around openness. I have seen, in particular, very recently during COVID, people saying that their code is open and shared when it isn't. And I think that that's the only point at which, um, and I know that there are a lot of sort of senior folk around the system who agree, that's the only point at which I think it becomes, mm -hmm. um, you know, maybe a little bit uh, moral. Okay. Well. We are a minute over time, but I'm going to ask you one last question because it summarizes a few others, what others have asked here. And that is, take us beyond the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, Open Safely has clearly set up an incredible platform for research use, but let's let's forget the pandemic. Let's look down the road. What do you see being the future for the kind of use of electronic health records in, let's say, more normal times, looking at more chronic diseases, et cetera, and indeed beyond that, you know, clinical trials, et cetera. What do you think the the future holds, especially look, in the UK, I suppose. Well, I mean, look, it's a no brainer um, and um, I didn't talk about it much today, but if you Google Goldacre review, um, you'll find the terms of reference for a review I'm doing for the Secretary of State for Health and Social Care on how we can get better, broader use of um, health data in the UK. Um, I think we have We've missed a trick. Um, for many, many years, people used to say the UK should be leading the field and we've got this huge potential, especially with our electronic health record data. And it's the primary care data that's particularly powerful. Our hospital data is as messy as um, other countries' hospital data, but our, our primary care data is an amazing and unique resource because it's in a single harmonized data schema whose great benefit is that it's a very simple one. It's just a list to which new events are appended. Um, we've not capitalised on that and we are now being overtaken. Um, in the review text draft, we've got um, graphs, including from the Taiwanese um, Health Service Research Database, which um, actually this is uh, something that my dad sent me because obviously I'm the nth generation in my family to do exactly the same job. Um, the Taiwanese research database, people talked about it as in theory, this will be used a lot more in the future. Now, if you look on PubMed, there's about 4000 publications from that research resource, um, almost all of which have appeared in the last seven years. Um, it dwarfs CPRD and other um, research data outputs from the UK. So there is such a thing as missing the boat and we're on the edge of it. Um, but I think COVID could and should be the turning point. Um, however, it all hangs on modern, open, reproducible techniques. You do not get the efficiency gains if you don't have a modular ecosystem like what we've built in Open Safely. The, the, the scale of the coding required to make electronic health record data usable is so huge that if you just rewrite it all from scratch using back to front logic in Stata to do your data management, um, bespoke for each study with no reuse, no unit testing, no code review, no nothing. Then you build the whole thing on a house of cards and it's like building a fridge from scratch with no fridge components every time you need a, a cold beer. It just makes no sense. Um, so, you know, everything to play for. If we do it the right way, I think we can still win it, but I think we're on the edge of losing. OK, perfect. Well, on that note, I think you've earned a cold beer this afternoon, but we appreciate you coming forward and, and doing today's seminar. I'm sure our audience has hugely enjoyed it. Just a reminder that you can see the recording in due course on NDPH TV and next week will be our final talk in the seminar. But in closing, on behalf of the department, everybody watching, Ben, thank you for your time. It's been great to listen to you and everybody have a good afternoon.